Joining a community can be unnerving. For some, they feel they have to pretend to be another person to fit in. But we're going to hear stories from people who have found themselves as valuable members of the community without sacrificing being their authentic selves. To learn more, tune into today's episode of The Uptake. Welcome to The Uptake with Anna Chu. This is a new show about all things tech and community. And this episode is brought to you by Avpoint. Over 16,000 customers and 7 million cloud users worldwide trust Avpoint to migrate, manage, and protect their cloud, on-premises, and hybrid environments. Avpoint is a cloud-based platform that helps customers extend their capability and how they can manage and govern Office 365, accelerating your digital transformation success. Welcome to The Uptake. This is a new show about all things tech and community. I'm your host, Anna Chu. I'll introduce you to people all over the world as we follow the path of Microsoft Ignite the Tour, traveling from city to city around the globe. We will cover topics in the world of tech, as well as uncover personal journeys of professional learning, development, and community building. If you're wondering what is community? For me, community is the family you choose. But I want to hear what you think. In this show, we're going to discover and figure this out together. My hope is that through the uptake, you will meet cool people in the community of tech, hear their stories, and get inspired to be part of a vast and expanding community in your area and beyond. Today's stop is in my home country of Australia, specifically in the city of Sydney. I'm excited to introduce today's co-host on The Uptake, Sonia Cuff. Sonia is a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft and she's joining us today from Australia. But specifically, which city are you joining us from, Sonia? Yeah, not Sydney. Um, I'm up in sunny Brisbane. So, Sonia, I believe that you are part of the extended dino family. Is that right? I am. Um, and I'm actually very proud to have the very first international dinosaur. So this is Dundee, the down under dino. Um, <laughs> he comes he, he comes from a land down under. And um, yeah, he, he represents down here in, uh, in my little bottom corner of the world in Australia. So oh, yeah. Oh, that's so Dundee. awesome. I would love Dundee the Hold on, is it Dundee the da- Down Under Dino? Is that how you? Uh-huh. Dundee yeah. the da- uh, the Down Under Dino to meet <laughs> Sunny. Um, Sunny is a new member of the Dino family as well, and uh, and Sunny is all about just spreading love and joy and smiles everywhere. So uh, you can find color. Sunny the T Rex on Twitter as well. <laughs> What's interesting about your career path is that you started off before Microsoft as a Microsoft MVP. I'd be really curious about how your journey has been from MVP to FTE and how you still maintain your connection to community. Yeah, sure. Um, The biggest thing that struck me when I became an FTE Blue Badge was the amount of people that I was meeting with the Microsoft as part of my role who already knew me. Mm. And that was absolutely through the activities that I was as I was doing as an MVP. And the community aspect is still so important because the community feedback and the interaction is the lifeblood of what I do as a cloud advocate. It mm. steers what content I go and make because I'm not interested in making stuff just for me. I want to know what people want to know about and where the gaps are in our content. So having that connection back to people to go, tell us, tell us what's frustrating you, tell us what you want to learn more about, that is completely critical to the success of this role. Yeah. And how has that shifted? Because I feel like you had a very direct connection to Microsoft already. So when you became an official Microsoft Blue Badge holder, how did that shift? Was it more that you were really part of Microsoft, that you were more in control of that relationship? Yeah, it is to a point. Look, certainly the blue badge comes with benefits in terms of emailing someone now with Microsoft.com at the end of my email address um, does get a different response, which is amazing. Um, But it's just, uh, it it still gives me the flexibility to go out and have the same conversations that that I was having just flipped in reverse because I know I can take that straight back to the product teams and have that deep technical conversation about where it fits into Microsoft's roadmap, for example. Yeah, 
And you still do a lot of travel. Has your travel schedule uh, only expanded in this new role? Uh, Look, it certainly has. When I came on board, Microsoft Ignite, the tour wasn't a thing. And I was fortunate to do the the first round when we did 17 cities. You know, this time around, it's 30 cities around the world. But I've got a great team and we we spread the travel love, which is great. So, you know, we could do a whole episode on work-life balance about what it's like to do a role like that and keep the family happy, right? But I've got a very supportive team and we do spread the load. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I definitely feel the pain because I've also been traveling. I just got back from Tokyo, the tour stopped there, and I'm heading to Sao Paulo tomorrow. So it should be, it's a very wild ride, but it's great to be able to connect with community in their home cities, right? So it's really awesome. So shifting gears a little bit, um, we're actually going to connect with someone who is an amazing community member in Australia, specifically the guest for our show today, Lorian Strant. Lorian, welcome to The Uptake. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, and you've been uh, quite involved with the local Australia, New Zealand uh, tech communities, but you're also super involved in the worldwide community. You're, you've got lots of friends from all corners of the globe. So I'd be really curious about how you even got started in community as a whole and how do you maintain those community connections, whether they're local or global? Um, look, it's... I think for me, I guess what I do is infused in my life. So in terms of that work-life balance, for me, the community is part of my life. My job is part of my life. So um, I started, I guess, locally. We didn't really have many user groups. It was still on-prem stuff back then. Mm. Um, So I more started connecting on, geez, what, before it was tech community, several versions before that. Um, I can't remember what, I think it was just TechNet forums. Um, Starting with, and connecting with people from around the world on there and answering questions and um, finding each other. And then after I became, um, got the MVP award and started going to summit and events, um, connecting with people globally. So for me, the global community is just as important as the local community. And mm. while we do have some more local um, aspects that are different from an international one, such as who we can buy through or our networks or those kind of things, at the end of the day, we still face very, very similar challenges. So for me, Being part of a global community is important because I learn lessons from people who are doing things that we haven't even thought of over here. So it's Mm. all one community for me. Yeah. And do you find that some of those challenges that the local community are having, that you're finding solutions that are are coming from different countries and applying them here in Australia? Yeah, absolutely. One Mm. of the things that I find absolutely invaluable is speaking with customers at events like Ignite. So not just Ignite the Tour, but Ignite over in um, in Orlando, because I get to see organisations that have potentially been doing things before we have in Australia or are actually behind. And so we can actually learn from each other. And so I take the learnings that I've got here to them uh, and also vice versa. So as I was saying, like it's for me, it's kind of much of a muchness in terms of local versus global. We all learn from each other um, and all have different benefits that we can share with each other. Larian, I just want to pick up on that point that you mentioned about integration, because I know one objection that we hear from people is that they just don't have the time. Like they're really busy doing their normal job mm. and they, they they just can't seem to figure out how they could do this community stuff over and above on top of yes. what they're already doing. So how do you make that work in, in your schedule? Yeah, it's, it's, I get asked that question quite a lot because people see me in a whole variety of different places um, in terms of community, I guess. It comes down to where you where you rate it in terms of importance. So as I was saying, like for me, it's all integrated. It's all the one thing. I am my job. My job is me. I am my family and those kind of things. So for that reason, my family becomes integrated in my work life. So, you know, for years, my family has actually come with me to conferences um, mm. and we've turned it into a holiday like Ignite just a few weeks ago. Um, I think in terms of going to local user groups and blogging or jumping on the community um, sites and having conversations online, I guess the thing is if you actually want to learn outside your sphere, then community is important. Otherwise, you're just living in your own bubble Mm. Um, and reading, you know, IT news articles or speaking to someone at a pub or something like that. But it's important to not necessarily just put yourself out there and say you need to blog and that's part of community, but actually to listen back from other people. Um, so that I think to your question, Sonia, it's how important is that? And I think that's the thing is that's, most people probably don't realize the importance of community to actually help their job. So mm. when they talk about that balance, I don't have time. Well, it's actually if you do if you make that time, it will actually save you time over here because you're saving learning the hard way 
from somebody else who's gone down that journey already. Mm. Yeah, what's interesting is that I hear a lot of people say that, you know, the opportunity for me to speak at an event like a user group or an event like Microsoft Ignite, actually some of the most beneficial interactions that they have are in the Q&A that happens straight after that session. So it's not just about you disseminating your expertise, it's also having that real life conversation um, on site at the event. And you've got a lot of experience at delivering um, sessions for Microsoft events. You've done events at Microsoft Ignite the Tour, Microsoft Ignite in Orlando recently. So tell us a little bit about that experience and why you love speaking at big events like this. Well, I guess the the thing for me is, I guess, because I live and breathe this, I have a lot of knowledge to share. Mm. Um, So I don't want to keep that knowledge to myself because who does it benefit other than my immediate circle? So Mm. um, I want to put the knowledge that I've got out there. If some people already know it, that's fine. Great. Fantastic for them. But if they don't, it's, you know, news for them. And I guess for me, like, if I go to a session at Ignite and I present and I've got 150, 200, whatever people in the room, um, if only one person comes up to me afterwards and says, thank you, I learned something from that, that is worth the hours I put into the prep and the uh, the creation of the content and the actual presentation itself. That's worth it to me because that one person now is going to take that and potentially impact hundreds or thousands of people or 15 people, and that's fine. So for me, it's been about, um, I guess, the more people I can share my knowledge with, the better. So mm-hmm. it's not for me about how many followers I have or the stats or, you know, look at my reach or anything like that. <laughs> it's the more people I can help, that's what, you know, gets my dopamine release. And I look, I love that you're someone in the community that that recognises that. We hear so many people saying that, They don't feel that they've got anything to say because everybody else knows so much and and Mm. what could they possibly add? But it's from our community that we get the real world stories of of what they've seen and what they've experienced. And that's something that as a, a Microsoft content producer, I can't reproduce. I can do it based on my own experience to a point, but everybody comes into tech and they face different scenarios. They have different perspectives and things they've come up against. And so that knowledge sharing, that real world flavor injected into what you're trying to do with Microsoft technology, that's absolutely priceless and such a valuable thing for our communities to share. Absolutely. I mean, the, the real world stories that I hear from people, as to whether it's a, um, a small 50 person financial firm or an 8,000 person retail um, organization, um, you know, a lot of the challenges are potentially similar. But I also hear of in our scenario, we have this. So one of the things that I see a lot right now because I've been doing a lot of work with government, um, both local but also community, is you know they want to innovate, they want to change and use things like Microsoft Teams, but the tools that they use, as an example, and this is in actually education as well, um, that they have to use to keep them compliant from a legislative perspective are actually mm-hmm. holding them back. So on one hand, we lament them because... Uh, you know, they're not innovative and moving with the times, but then they we will also lament them if they do and break away from being compliant. So having that kind of knowledge and hearing that both locally as well as globally um, really helps kind of look at the conversation, take it back to the product group, but also find people in the community and say, well, hang on, how did you get around that? What are you addressing there? And the community is not just necessarily about IT pros, it's also about the businesses. So I can mm-hmm. have conversation with two different universities and with you know, head of learning in this particular area and say, hey, actually, I was speaking to that university. Why don't I facilitate a conversation? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the community is not just about IT pro or people who use Office 365. It's about people who have shared goals and challenges who want to learn from each other. Yeah, 100%. I think a lot of what Sonia was saying too is that for people who feel like they don't have anything to contribute, you still just have to put something out there and even that could be a validation for someone else, right? But that they that they also are experiencing that challenge or are in a very similar scenario or the circumstances are, are very similar to what they're seeing. So it's really just, you know, a matter of people putting their story out there and hoping that, you know, they're getting some kind of response. But, you know, I also manage the Microsoft tech community and we know that majority of the people who come to the tech community are lurkers, but it doesn't mean that they're not um, getting any value out of being in the tech community by not replying. But even you just putting something out there is contributing to the community, uh, even in a very passive context. Um, But one thing I want to touch on, just moving slightly uh, 90 degrees here, um, 
on the same topic of validation, you delivered a session, Lorian, um, on uh, mental health, specifically ADHD. And I think that was incredibly brave of you because not many people feel comfortable talking about that, but you delivered that uh, particular session um, to the public and the recording is up online if anyone wants to check it out. Um, but yeah, I think um, you touched on a really uh, 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 compelling and um, very interesting perspective, your own personal perspective on on what you're, you've been experiencing when it comes to ADHD. And I know this is a topic even very close to Sonia's heart because she had one of the most uh, uh, popular sessions in the prior year uh, about uh, IT burnout, not by any means uh, the same, but certainly in the same spectrum of things. Um, so tell us a little bit more about, you know, how you felt approaching, you know, submitting a topic about ADHD for a, for a tech conference? Um, well, firstly, I can't take complete credit for it because I was up there with um, fellow MVP Christina Wheeler and Laurie Potline from Microsoft, who I think were also very brave to to come out. Some of them had not, uh, neither of them, I think, had publicly actually disclosed um, ADHD, mm. uh, whereas I'd already kind of gone, hey, everybody, this is what I've got. Yeah. Um, I think... Um, yeah, there's, there's there's a danger of putting it out there and it potentially being perceived as a weakness, but it does have its benefits. The thing that I try to avoid is seeing that as a superpower because to me saying it as a superpower means that, well, other people don't have the benefit of yeah. superpowers. Hmm. So like anything, it has its benefits and its weaknesses. One is that I can work on multiple things at the same time, but the weakness is I may not necessarily go deep into those. Mm. So I think the reason why I wanted to, I guess, put that out there and start that conversation is because I'd always felt weird and a little bit of an outcast and, oh, that's just Laurie and he's just weird or different <laughs> or says things that are, you know, off-timed or doesn't, you know, has no tact and those kind of things. Um, and it's not to excuse those behaviours, but mm. more to understand that, Sometimes they're not always within our control um, and that it's not just about ADHD. It's also about autism, which my beautiful wife actually also, um, she has, uh, she's autistic. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been a journey between the two of us is just, you know, figuring out how to work with that and her figuring out how to work with me and how those two things work against and for each other. Mm. Um, but I think that uh, it's more important for people to have a conversation about mental health and yeah. Mental health doesn't just have to be a neuro, um, a, like a wiring of the brain thing. It could also be that you've just got some crap going on in your life where you haven't had your coffee. But if more people actually open about this is affecting me today, right now, all through my life, mm -hmm. we can then appreciate and understand it and then tailor around that and go, okay, haven't had your coffee or come back to you. Or, okay, that's how you work. Mm. What can I do to support that so that we can get the best out of you? So to that point where I can say I can work on a ton of things at once um, and work really quickly, but not go deeply into some of them. Cool. Pair me up with someone who does go deep and who will tease the questions out of me so that we can actually get a complete picture, not Lorian's 90%. Oh, I'm bored now. I'm going over here. Um, so I think the more that people have that conversation and realize that mental health challenges, neurodiversity are not weaknesses, they're yeah. just differences, which we're all genetically different, then the sooner we'll actually be working together and on the same page. Absolutely, and it really is great to see Microsoft talk about the human side of IT. It's, you know, when you start to understand the, the people in this industry and the, you know, the, the things that they have going on in their worlds over and above, you know, the, the technical response you might see, it, it does bring us a little bit closer together. And I find that when I talk about topics like this, so many people identify with it and go, mm. my gosh, I've I've been feeling like that or I, you know, I, I have the same things or, and it, it's those kind of little interactions of building those relationships, which I think makes our technical communities really special. Yeah. I yeah. think well, one, I found, sorry, go ahead, Lorian. Well, the, the session that we ran, the un, unconference session, um, what was really great about it was some people actually made the comment that it was the best session they've had all week. And I think it was because, they were able to be open and authentic and not hide behind the visage of I'm an IT professional, that's who I am. They're able to say, I'm a human, these are my challenges, how do we work, you know, how can we learn off each other to mm -hmm. work? So while in that room the intent was to talk about how Office 365 can be used to help with ADHD, we actually ended mm -hmm. up talking about other things to do with um, 
you know, how you get to work and what music you listen to and your physical working space. So it wasn't just about that particular tech. It was about how we exist. We actually even started going into um, personal lives, how we balance our relationships and, um, and how we also might need a third space to kind of go from work to home mm. um, so that I don't just walk out the door here and switch modes because it doesn't work like that. Yeah. So that conversation just, I think, really connected the room to each other and went, oh, okay, yeah, we're all humans here. We've all got different versions of the same stuff. Mm. We can, you know, by accepting that, we just can realize that we're not wrong. We're not, you know, rejects. We're not outcasts. We're all different. Like everybody is uniquely the same. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it just allows us to move on with that. Yeah. One of the, um, I think it's really important that we talk about these conversations, even in a tech conference, because ultimately mental health, amongst other things, they all affect the community. And one um, particular area is covering as well. And for those of our listeners who don't know what covering is, covering is all about sort of hiding a part of yourself just because you are afraid of what that might mean for how you're perceived. Um, and so for some people, maybe they do want to cover that they're autistic or have ADHD or that they're from the LB LGBTQ community, right? And I think, you know, people, it, ultimately it's their choice on how they want to present themselves themselves, but we also want them to feel like they don't have to cover if they don't want to. And I don't, and I don't know if um, every uh, community out there feels that they can um, be their authentic self, but definitely here in the tech community, uh, the community that is extensive uh, around Microsoft, uh, we welcome people to be their true authentic selves. And I think that also helps people feel that they're not alone in the community, that they are part of a wider community and it is super diverse. There are people who look like me, who look like you, who have also hidden traits that are not perceivable to the human eye. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, it's our second year in covering topics such as that uh, as part of Microsoft Ignite and I, I really applaud both of you for for putting some of the some some of your experiences out there. If I can jump in, I think Sonia's topic about burnout is um, really prevalent in um, our industry because we are so connected. Yeah. So it's really easy for us to um, blur the lines and continue on working when we probably should switch off. And especially when you work like from home where it's easy for me to just disappear mm. um, for hours at a time. And one of the things that I've discovered is the burnout for me, I don't think is necessarily what others would see as burnout because I just keep powering through stuff, but mm. it does take effect in other ways. Um, so I think what would it, I think what probably would help for people to do is to not necessarily recognize that I'm this, I'm ADHD, I'm autistic, I'm burnout is, I'm human, I have defects and I have strengths like everybody does and to try and make little micro changes. Um, so, you know, saying things like for me, um, you know, if I come to the study, I can lose time because of hyper-focus. So I will yeah. now set an audible timer and go, right, set a time of 15 minutes. When that happens, tools down, walk out. Um, go be with the family. So it's important. I think that's just one tiny example um, is, you know, don't kind of have a breakdown and go, I've got to change everything. Yeah. It's change little things and tweak and adjust. And whether it's burnout, whether it's any other aspect of mental well-being, it's these little tweaks will find you to your happy place. Um, and I think that's what people need to probably just be, you know, accepting that a change doesn't have to be a massive thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that tweaking and adjusting is really important as well, because even if you've got two people with ADHD or two people going through burnout, it's not the same thing for both of those people. They are two very different people. So what works for you might be different than what works for somebody else. And then as life changes, as job roles change, as families grow, all these different changes and circumstances in our life, what used to work for you might not work anymore. You might need something different. And I, I know that certainly that moving into this role and the demands that it has, how I handle my, my balance and, and when I switch off and when I don't has changed. And it all comes down to the fact that most of us in this industry are super passionate about what we do, right? We mm -hmm. love our jobs. Yes. And it makes it super hard to actually want to switch off. Off. And like, as you said, Lauren, some of those other signs and symptoms start to creep in that show us that maybe we are a little bit out of balance, which is hard when emotionally we're going, but I'm loving what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's, 
I, I think p- people having control over their time, it's actually a lot more difficult than you think, especially when you are super passionate and you t- you may even overextend yourself. So, but I think even just talking about IT, uh, burnout in the IT industry in a very open way helps people recognize, you know what, I am you know, a little off the scale in terms of how I'm spending my time when it comes to work-life balance. So I think it's a really important Mm -hmm. topic to be covering. Well, I was just going to say, I think one of the challenges we have is um, using those and adjusting to modern life because me, for example, I'm a huge advocate of working from home and being able to pick up my kids, but I still have this thing that I've grown up with that work is between 8.30 to 5.30 Mm. and that I must do eight hours. So if I do 10 hours in a day or 12 hours, it still doesn't change the fact that the next day I need to, I feel mentally compelled to. And I think we're almost kind of hardwired. So that's one of the challenges we have as a society is, yeah, we can tweak and adjust and all these other things, but that we also kind of have to overcome that mental programming um, that we've had, you know, all through our adult lives and our our childhood lives as well, watching our parents, that the workday is X, you know, X hours and, you know, X time of the day. Um, but then that becomes the challenge of if you don't stop working because you kind of start and stop and start and stop, then that presents a new challenge. So fun journey ahead of us for all yeah. of us. Yeah, 100%. So, Lorian, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. You've had an amazing uh, experience as an MVP. You've been part of Microsoft Ignite and Microsoft Ignite the Tour. I think I'm going to see you in Sydney, so very excited yep. about that. But for those of our listeners who aren't able to go all the way to Sydney, what's the best way for them to follow you and learn more about your work? I would say probably the best place is find me on Twitter, just at Lorraine Strand, um, mainly because there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are no walls on Twitter. So uh, <laughs> you can start a conversation with me, ask me a question and I will answer. Um, and I think that's probably the easiest way because, yes, while we have LinkedIn and Facebook, all these other things, Twitter is probably going to be the best way. Um, and, yeah, just I think don't, feel free to ask any kind of question. There are no stupid questions. And if it just means that maybe you didn't know something that's actually over here and here's the answer. Um, So yeah, find me there. If you are in Melbourne, um, there is the Melbourne Microsoft 365 technical meetup, I think we've just renamed it to, um, that I host once a month uh, with a few others. So come along to that. Um, And again, any question, any audience, anything you want to know, just ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask. We'll include links to your Twitter handle and uh, your user group in the show notes. So thank you again, Lorian. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, Sonia and I will talk about the upcoming stops on Microsoft Ignite the Tour, how to find user groups in your area so and more. So don't go away. It was great talking with our guest, Lorian Strant, today. Sonia, what were some of your takeaways from what Lorian talked about? I love how Lorian talks about being part of the community is just a natural part of the work that he does. That's the thing that really hit home for me because I know we've all got a limited amount of time, right? But Lorian very much sees it as a two-way street. He's there because being part of the community means that he can learn things from other people, but he also recognises that the stuff that he knows that he can share with other people too. Mm. And not only that, but because of his experience with ADHD and through his wife's experience with autism as well, that he can still continue that learning and still give back to the community. And potentially there are people in the community who also have neurodiverse needs who can still be a very valuable member in the community. Yeah, that's right. And you don't see that so much when you're talking to people about technical stuff. Yeah. But it's um, it's amazing when you open up and go to that next level of discussion about who we are as people and you start to find, you know, the people that are just like you too. Yeah, 100%. Um, And, you know, one of the things that I really care about is the Microsoft tech community. It's been around for four years now, which is crazy to me. Um, But tell us how you use the Microsoft tech community for those who might not be familiar to it. Oh, look, and I remember when it first launched. So I think (laughs) I was pretty, pretty quick to sign up at the start. Um, Tech community is a really important part of my role. We have a team blog. uh, We have a short link at IT Ops Talk 
blogs.com that redirects to one of our, our blogs on the platform. And that's great because the best part of blogging in that platform is the comments at the bottom and those conversations we can have around that content. Um, I'm always checking up on the different product group areas to find out information about the products that I'm interested in, what discussions are going on around that as well. And then, of course, we also have a lot of announcements that happen mm. on the platform as well. So product group blogs or um, posts that link back to other official sites about what's just been released. So it really is the hub of not only being able to keep informed with what's going on, but being able to talk with the rest of the community about the topics that we're all interested in. Yeah, I think one of the things that I love about the Microsoft tech community, especially when I talk to a talk about it to our engineering team is that it's that one place that we can say is the official place for them to go and collect customer feedback to gauge how the community is feeling about specific announcements or features that they've just launched and released. So finding, if you need that official space, then certainly go to the Microsoft tech community. But beyond tech community, are there any other ways that you'd recommend for people to stay engaged, to stay up to date and continue learning? And it, look, it really depends on what you're into. I found mm. what's worked for me definitely has been Twitter. Yeah. And I joined I joined Twitter because there was a Microsoft Tech Ed conference in Australia that I couldn't attend. Mm. So I opened up a Twitter account and I stalked the conference hashtag <laughs> and started connecting with some people who were talking about the same things I was interested in. And so Twitter has been my default home for building not only a, a good community of friends I've still got from those interactions through to keeping on top of, you know, the buzz of what's going on and in the world, both inside and outside of tech. Um, you know, maybe you're more into Reddit or some of those other platforms. Um, they don't quite do it for me, but find your tribe, find where people are talking about the stuff you're passionate about. Yeah. And not only online communities too, but in person as well. I think you just wrapped up um, speaking at a, a local community group. Um, what, other, what are the ways for people to find local community groups for them to join? Yeah. So what we found is that um, most of our community leaders publish on other sites like Eventbrite or, or meetup.com, those kind of things. And so really just doing a search is your best friend. I know if I'm going to another city, I'll jump on those websites and like just type in Azure or, you know, Microsoft and, and see what communities pop up that, that people are running in those areas. Yeah. And actually just a shameless plug as well. There is a community events section in the Microsoft tech community. People are putting all of their events, whether they're virtual, in person, um, people are really posting a lot of great meetups there. So if you're trying to find something in your local area, check it out. But even if you still can't find anything, um, I'm sure that there are local communities who are probably just don't know about the Microsoft tech community. So make sure that you spread the word and let people know that they can do that. Well, so, don't start one up yourself. We need more local local community groups. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We absolutely do. Um, there are a ton of people who are out there who are willing to help too. Many of them who are MVPs, RDs, even Microsoft certified trainers or MCTs. So yeah, feel free to hit people up in the community. You'll find that they're more than generous. It's actually quite surprising. So sure. yeah, definitely a great suggestion there. So Sonia, thank you so much for co-hosting this episode of The Uptake with me. Loved having you on the show. If people want to find you online, it sounds like they can find you on Twitter, anywhere else that they can find you. <laughs> they certainly can. So at Sonia Cuff on Twitter or connect with me on LinkedIn. Great. Thank you so much again. And we will talk with you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks again to my Australia-based co-host, Sonia Cuff, and our guest, Lorian Strant. I highly encourage you to visit the Microsoft Tech community to find events in your area, around the world, and online. You can also discover Microsoft learning paths, blogs, and event recaps. Go to techcommunity.microsoft.com. Join, learn, activate your mind. You will not be disappointed. If you'd like to reach out, share your favorite community story, or send us some swag to be featured on the desk at The Uptake, you can follow me on Twitter at underscore a -chew. Please subscribe to the show and write a review. It really does help people find the show. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends, colleagues, local community. It helps us spread the word and the community love. And if you like The Uptake, there is another Modern Workplace podcast you will love. 
Check out Shift Happens with Microsoft MVP and Regional Director Dux Raymond Sai. Each week, Dux interviews and shares the story of a modern workplace professional leading the charge at their organization. The first season includes some of the biggest initiatives at the biggest brands, including United Airlines, H&M, Heathrow Airport, and more. See what it takes to overcome the logistical, technical, and personal hurdles that stand between you and making Shift happen. Find Shift Happens wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again to our guest, Lorian Strant, my co-host today, Sonia Cuff, and our sponsor, Avpoint. And to you, our listeners and viewers, I'm your host, Anna Chu. Stay tuned for our next episode, and I'll see you out there in the community.